Okay, um, good evening, um, everybody. Um, I think we've got 100 participants coming into the room. Um, I, think that, I think that's it. Um, if I could just ask everyone, um, just to make sure you're on um, mute, um, please. Um, my name's Lynn Timely, I'm the chair of the Middle Temple Historical Society and on behalf of the Society and the Inn, a very warm welcome um, this evening. We've got a, a great show of, um, I think there's a lot of students from the Inn here and also I understand some students um, who are not uh, members of the Inn but I think, I think from another university from memory so you are all very, very welcome. Um, I'm just looking at um, my list of names and we also, I see, um, with some Masters of the Bench present, you're very welcome. And also we have um, a number of the Society's um, members present. Um, why I've just welcomed everyone separately, um, it, it is great to see um, uh, people here for the first time um, but not uh, not everyone will be aware or everyone will will maybe even uh, know uh, Master John Mitchell um, but uh, Master Mitchell some of the students of the inn will know him um, from the qualifying sessions and the moots and of course the other masters of the bench will already know what I have to say um, but um, it's a uh, uh, with with extreme sadness that I have to tell um, everyone that John unfortunately very sadly passed away on uh, Saturday. Saturday passed. He had intended to be here this evening um, with his wife um, Marlene um, and uh, we just heard on Monday morning um, from the inn that he'd sadly passed away suddenly. So um, for those of you that haven't heard the news, I'm hoping that, that most of the people that were connected with the Inn um, have already heard either via the Inn or on the Twitter account. Um, but for those of you that hadn't and that know Master Mitchell, um, I'm sorry that you really had to hear like this because it, it, uh, it's just a bit, of, I imagine, a bit of a shock and, and something to process when you come in um, thinking that you're, you're just going to hear a lecture and you hear that news. Um, but I just want to pay tribute to John um, for all the work that he did. He was responsible really for, for bringing the society into the 21st century. He had over the years, and, and I, I have lost count, I think it was either nine or 10 years that he was the chair. And um, he, he brought in some brilliant speakers, including um, our speaker today, uh, Richard Bork. Um, it was John who organised uh, Richard to come to talk to us. And um, those of you who know John will also know um, Marlene. So um, I have, uh, I've sent him, uh, to Marlene and uh, her sons, I've sent the condolences of all the members um, of the society and uh, the committee. So um, in relation to um, this meeting, um, it is a qualifying session. Not all of our meetings um, will uh, be capable of being qualifying sessions, but this one, because um, of its relevance um, to modern aspects of the law is. If any students or anyone who's here who isn't a member wants to join, um, it's the princely sum of 10 pounds a year. We normally meet um, around four times a year. We have a joint meeting with um, uh, either Inner Temple or Lincoln's Inn or one of the other, uh, the historical societies for one of our meetings. And then we, we normally rearrange, uh, rearrange three other meetings um, ourselves. And um, so if anyone's interested, the details are all on the Middle Temple website. Um, but in future, what we've had in the past, certainly before the pandemic, we had supper parties in, the, uh, in Middle Temple. Um, those cost £30 or, or for, um, for members or non-members and £15 for students. What the plan is moving forward, we are going to have all the meetings, even if in the event that we can go back to full supper parties, we're going to have the meetings um, going live um, via Zoom in the future. 
So hopefully that means that more of our members who live outside London will be able to join and also it will uh, facilitate our student um, members uh, joining as well. And again, everything moving forward, booked via the in website as you would any dinings or qualifying sessions. This is a qualifying session um, on the basis that uh, the Burkean thinking has influenced um, both the sovereignty argument around Brexit um, and also the discourse um, on the modern discourse on human rights that, um, uh, that Burke called um, natural rights. So um, we're good to go and it is a great honour to welcome um, Professor um, Richard Bork. He is Professor of History of Political Thought uh, at Cambridge University and a Fellow of King's College. He was elected as a Fellow of the uh, British Academy and also to his chair at Cambridge, both in 2018. He's a co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Political Thought. He sits on a, a number, so many, in fact, I lost count of editorial um, boards, also lost count of his publications, widely, widely published, and he teaches and supervises um, research students um, at Cambridge. First degree was from UCD in Dublin, and he also holds a BA in Classics from Birkbeck, uh, University of London, and his doctorate is from Cambridge. And uh, the, the talk today um, is uh, in relation to Edmund Burke, the Anglo-Irish statesman, and of course, Middle Templar. And uh, Professor Bork published uh, his biography of Burke, uh, Empire and, and uh, Revolution, published by uh, Yale University Press in 2015. So um, the talk lasts around 40 to 45 minutes. Then there will be an opportunity for questions. Um, Oliver's put some notes in the chat regarding the questions. So um, if I could ask, as we're going along, if you want to populate the chat with any questions and uh, also your name, if it, doesn't, uh, if it doesn't appear on your link. Um, then we'll take the questions um, around about a quarter or 10 to eight. Um, I will relay any questions that have come in on the chat. If we have any time after that, um, then we'll invite any further questions um, directly um, if you want to unmute and, well, raise a hand and then on, on, on mute and then come through with a question. But we'd encourage um, you as you, as as the evening goes along, if you can populate the questions in the chat, um, that means that we can get more questions um, through to Richard. So, um, Richard, thank you so much um, for being here this evening. If I could now hand over to you. Well, great. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I should say at the outset, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be addressing the Middle Temple Historical Society, especially on this subject. Uh, given that this talk, however, is via Zoom, which wasn't the original pre-pandemic plan, uh, and there's a large range of information that I have to share, um, I'll be um, using PowerPoint. And so I'm going to have to share my screen, um, regrettably at the cost of my own head being reduced to a small box in the corner of your uh, computers. So if I can do that to begin with. Okay, so um, Edmund Burke was, I think it's important to say at the outset, uh, a lawyer. He qualified as a barrister, as you know, from Middle Temple. He was a parliamentarian, he was an orator, and also a publicist. And uh, I think it's important to emphasize one of the greatest advocates of his age. He brought uh, philosophy to politics and new levels of eloquence to English prose. What I'm going to do this evening is, um, first of all, outline fairly briefly the contours of Burke's life. Um, then I'm going to present to you the main concerns that uh, took up his political career. Uh, and then I'm going to move specifically to address his response to the revolution in France, which raise issues uh, connected to rights and connected to sovereignty 
and what I'm going to do is present to, what I'm going to do is present to you extracts from his great work, The Reflections on the Revolution in France, published on the 1st of November 1790. Let's begin at the beginning, however. As you can see, Burke was born in Dublin on the 12th of January 1730. He entered Trinity College Dublin to take a general degree in humanities and sciences, as it was then, uh, in um, 1744. He arrived in, in London, however, in May 1750 to study for the bar at uh, Middle Temple. Now, I want to say a little bit about Middle Temple before uh, moving on. First of all, that Burke's name was actually entered at the temple on the 23rd of April, 1747, um, in order to plan advan in advance his entry because becoming a barrister meant upward mobility for him. His father had been, by comparison, an attorney. Now, neither the King's Inns in Dublin nor Trinity College Dublin offered legal tuition. Therefore, enrolment at an English inn with a view to completing eight terms in commons had been a formal requirement for those wishing to become barristers in Ireland actually since the 16th century. Now, the intention of training these barristers in England originally was to purge Gaelic customs derived from Breton laws from common law usage. Now, it might be worth uh, bearing in mind that the cost of a legal training at Middle Temple in the period for the, the whole of the legal trainings, that's therefore in total, came to £1,500, which was a considerable sum at the time. Qualification uh, meant uh, the right uh, on the part of those who graduated as qualified to use the title Esquire after their names. Now, 200 barristers uh, practiced in Ireland at this time, and this included convert lawyers. Convert lawyers are an important category because you need to remember that in the 18th century, under the penal laws, not only were Catholics not able to practice law and therefore be barristers, uh, but couldn't uh, inherit property um, by primogeniture, uh, couldn't um, vote in elections, couldn't in all senses freely practice their religion, and couldn't sit in Parliament. So conversion was a way of, as it were, um, achieving a degree of social mobility. Interestingly, more than a third of students at the Middle Temple came from Ireland in the 1750s, and Irish circles congregated at the Grecian Coffee House in Devereux Court. Inns in the 18th century um, were not particularly associated with studious application. Uh, this is illustrated by Henry Fielding's comic drama of 1730 called the Temple Bow, uh, which rather illustrated the comparatively dissolute lifestyle of the time compared with, as it were, diligent application as a, a student lawyer. Now, after the Glorious Revolution, which is to say 1688, the inns played no significant part in educating students. Formal lectures had ceased um, even before 1688. So novices, this is to say those training for the, for the, for the bar, uh, they attended court, uh, that was one mode of practice, they, parti they participated in moots, but largely they engaged in private study uh, via um, un dry, uninspiring textbooks, which were largely uh, compendia of the law, really lists, because um, the English law had not uh, been collected into a coherent digest until, of course, uh, Blackstone did so in the middle of the 1760s with his commentaries on the laws of England. So what did Burke get from being a lawyer? Well, first of all, he grew to respect what we might call legal reasoning as opposed to what in the 18th century was called natural reason, which we might think of as mathematical reasoning. In other words, examining principles in the abstract. Legal reasoning involved um, perfecting the um, application and refinement of judgment in relation to cases. So um, it was at once contextual and incremental and evolving and empirical. And that's what appeals to Burke. And this cast 
um, a shadow, if you like, or inspired his uh, mode of proceeding in his political argumentation. So his legal training was crucial to his approach to politics. In addition, Burke learned to appreciate the value of prescription. Now, I will come back to that in the main uh, body of my talk. Um, a basic principle to common law, which will end up being significant for Burke's understanding of politics and his defense of rights. So as a result, really, of Burke's defense of prescriptive right, that's to say, the appeal to precedent as a means of legitimating a given practice, as a result of that, uh, Burke defended at the same time a tradition, but also a uh, um, custom and established practice um, as all having their own, if you like, rationale. So it's for this reason that Burke is associated with conservatism. This is where we come to the legacy aspect. But uh, in actual fact, uh, Burke was a Whig throughout his career and never a Tory. He was only co-opted by the Conservative Party, as has been pointed out by another scholar, Emily Jones, around about the middle of the 1880s for particular reasons that I won't go into. Although uh, Burke appreciated the authority of legal precedent, I'll go on to show that in fact he believed that uh, rights themselves ultimately trumped precedent, which is significant for his arguments in the midst of the French Revolution. He also believed that um, our rights or our natural rights legitimized the appeal to um, revolution itself. Um, so there's, they, this shows you some ways in which Burke used his Middle Temple experience, if you like, to guide his um, political reflections. But Burke did not become a barrister. Uh, Burke opted instead, first of all, to pursue what one might call a life as a man of letters or a literary life. Um, publishing uh, particular volumes in the middle of the 1750s, as you can see on your screen, for instance, The Vindication of Natural Society in 1756, and his work on uh, the aesthetic categories of the sublime and beautiful in 1757. However, Burke's career changed dramatically in 1765 when he became secretary to the Marquis of Rockingham. Uh, in fact, in July of that year, and Mar the Marquis of Rockingham was leading the first Rockingham administration. He was therefore basing the British Prime Minister. Um, uh, Burke became his secretary and um, on the basis of that stood for Parliament, in fact, a safe, uh, for a safe seat um, uh, and entered Parliament in January 1766. From that point um, until his retirement from Parliament in 1794, all his activities were determined by, if you like, the parliamentary almanac. Whatever came before Parliament is what uh, uh, would have concerned him. So his preoccupations are largely determined by the processing of business in Parliament. As I say, he retired from Parliament in 94. He then died um, on the 9th of July in 1797. Now, I said I'd uh, mention the main areas that concerned Burke through his career. And I, I would enumerate these as uh, five in number in bold on your on your screens. First of all, the American crisis. Second, the unfolding Irish situation. Uh, third of all, the situation in India. You have to remember Britain in the 18th century is an imperial power and as it were increasingly becoming such. Uh, domestic politics, uh, his concern with Britain, in other words. And then from 1789 onwards, um, a major application of his political uh, rhetoric and intelligence to the revolution um, in France, which was a preoccupation of his until his death. Now, I say the American crisis, meaning, of course, the American Revolution, uh, beginning with uh, the Stamp Act crisis uh, and then uh, the repeal of the Stamp Act. Uh, the repeal of the Stamp Act took place under the Rockinghams and Burke had a role in the drafting of the act itself. From then through to the Declaration of Independence of 1776, and then through the final um, victory on the part of the American colonies in the War of Independence in 1783, Burke engaged with this uh, Western theater of the empire. Throughout the same period, he also, as, as I mentioned, uh, engaged with various aspects of the Irish situation, including uh, what were known as the white boys in 1766, basically, 
an agrarian insurgent movement, which exposed the situation um, in Ireland. But also from around about 1780, 1778, Burke was um, uh, involved in liberalizing trade between Ireland and Britain and the empire, and also extending toleration. Remember, the penal laws were in operation and toleration meant a process of liberation from them. And then finally, between 92 and 95, Burke is campaigning for the extension of the franchise to um, Roman um, Catholics, which did then happen in 1795. A Catholic emancipation, full Catholic emancipation, did not come yet. In other words, the right to sit in Parliament, as you may know, that came uh, considerably after Burke's death, actually in 1829. Now, a very major concern throughout Burke's uh, career as a whole was uh, the East India Company, which was a trading company um, which, as it were, represented Britain's relationship to various areas of um, India, Bombay, Bengal and Madras, principally where the East India Company had factories. But it's around about this time that in addition to having trading factories, the East India Company uh, began to uh, increase its uh, military power and extend its territorial might in, um, in those uh, theatres. This led the uh, Westminster government to seek to regulate the East India Company and Burke was first, his first engagement with India uh, occurs in that context in his response to Lord North's uh, re preparation for the Regulating Act between 1766 and 73. Uh, Burke's attention thereafter turns from Bengal, which is uh, what the Regulating Act largely concerned, to Madras, um, where um, he believed the um, East India Company had been involved in corrupt practices. And this experience led him to um, be involved in the drafting of what are known as Fox's India Bills. Actually, these are drafted again by uh, Burke. These were attempt, an attempt to call the East India Company to account by subordinating it to parliamentary jurisdiction. So this is a sort of epochal moment in British history for that reason. However, the bills failed. They never became an act, um, substantially because they were opposed by um, George, uh, George III. Um, the Fox administration therefore fell and Burke um, set about um, serving the cause of India by another means at that point, which is by launching the impeachment of Warren Hastings. Uh, that took place between roughly speaking 1785 uh, until 1794 when uh, uh, Hastings was acquitted. So the impeachment failed. But this is an important moment in British legal history. The use of a legal instrument to call to account a, a trading company, which was an arm of empire and therefore to subject empire, if you like, to legal norms for the first time in European history. That was the ambition of the uh, impeachment. Well, Burke, as I said, was also involved in, um, in Br British affairs, uh, especially debates around the relationship between party and parliament, um, but also later on um, uh, debate about the rights of uh, religious dissenters uh, and also bids for parliamentary reform. But his attention then turned to France after the uh, revolution began in May 1789. Um, and that concern um, ended only with his own death. Now, the French Revolution, of course, was an attempt uh, to hold the French executive to account in a period of massive um, indebtedness on the part of the state. Um, the, mechanisms for, the mechanism for account holding was to be the estates general, which had been in a state of desuetude since 1614 and was now reconvened in May 1789. But the Estates General immediately entered into a period of, um, as it were, controversy over um, how it was to exercise its function. In the end, being very brief about this, the Estates General voted to convert itself into a National Assembly. The National Assembly then decided in the tennis court oath to remain in session until a constitution was, for France was um, promulgated. In advance of the constitution, however, there occurred a declaration of the rights of, uh, ma uh, rights of man and the citizen. 
Now, uh, Burke's engagement with France in the first instance was a skeptical and critical uh, inquiry into the nature and status of that um, declaration. He was critical of it on several fronts. First, on the grounds that it um, suspended all due regard for prescriptive rights and appealed to natural rights instead. That's his first area of um, objection. He wants to defend a version of prescriptive rights. Second of all, um, he wanted to suggest that the appeal to natural rights on the part of the French Revolution uh, revolutionaries was wholly um, hypocritical in nature. They appealed to the natural rights of property and the rights of conscience. But at the same time, they attacked the institution of the church and they also invaded its own rights of um, property, which it being the Gallican Church of France was a considerable volume of property. So the church lands were seized by the revolutionary government in November 1789 and used as security against the issuing of a new paper currency. As far as Burke was concerned, this was an epic unprecedented invasion of the um, rights of property in Europe since um, the 17th uh, century and it's on that basis that he attacked them. So let me turn now to this business of rights particularly and here you have before you an extract from Burke's reflections on the revolution in France and I want to talk about uh, three main um, extracts um, in, the, in the remaining portion of my talk. Being lawyers, you'll be interested, or many of you being lawyers, you'll be interested in text. And here we have in front of us, um, here we have in front of us pieces of, um, uh, of, of text itself. So um, I'm going to uh, talk through these, beginning with Burke's um, questioning of what the meaning of um, the phrase, the rights of man or the rights of men. Uh, and man and men, uh, incidentally, mostly mean persons in the 18th century, since uh, of course, uh, women didn't have electoral rights, but they did have other rights. So rights of man means human rights. Um, anyway, Burke is saying, these, they, uh, the French Revolution, revolutionaries, they have, in inverted commas, scare quotes, the rights of men. He goes on to say, Against these, there can be no prescription. Against these, no agreement is binding. These admit no temperament, meaning no uh, modification, no compromise. Anything withheld from their full demand is so much fraud and injustice. Against these, their rights of men, let no government look for security in the length of its continuance. Of course, that would be a prescriptive right. Uh, the authority of government de uh, uh, deriving from uh, the length of its continuance, the passage of time itself conferring uh, right, or the justice and lenity of its administration. So Burke is saying these, uh, this appeal to natural rights abandons altogether prescriptive rights, which means in practice that the French revolutionaries are treating France as a tabula rasa dismantling all institutions of state and all inherited laws altogether, this is not a common law practice, all inherited laws altogether with a view to beginning ab initio, with no guide whatsoever, apart from one's own, as it were, mathematical reasoning, by comparison with other, as it were, the legal reasoning uh, that one ordinarily applies to um, uh, judging appropriate legislation in context. So that's what Burke was against, their abandonment of prescriptive rights. However, Burke in the end did not believe that uh, prescriptive rights were absolute. On the contrary, he believed in the last instance that prescriptive rights should yield to natural rights. So that then the dispute between Burke and the revolutionaries um, is what should be our natural rights and how ought these translate into the civil domain? So what do we have uh, what rights do we have before the formation of governments and how ought governments to represent these rights that we, um, by natural human right, um, have? Now, you will notice that many of the rights um, articulated by Burke, which I'm about to um, come to, will be familiar to you from the Human Rights Act of 19. 
1998. Uh, and similarly, uh, of course, therefore, uh, since this is an incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights of 1950, um, you will see that these uh, modern rights um, echo many of the rights which were celebrated in the 18th um, century. So Burke begins in the, the bit that I've highlighted in red here. Um, far am I from denying in theory, full as far is my heart from withholding in practice, if I were of power to give or to withhold the real rights of men. He's saying there, in other words, I am not denying uh, in principle at all the justification of real human rights. Of course, these are, uh, exist and are true. What he's denying is the false claim of rights on the part of the French revolutionaries. As he says, in denying their false claims of right, I do not mean to injure those which are real and are such as their pretended rights would totally destroy. If civil society be made for the advantage of man, all the advantages for which it is made become his right. So that's to say, all the benefits that we um, enjoy in society are our rights. That's what rights are. It is an institution of beneficence in the sense of bene and facio, doing good. That is, is to say, it's um, socially useful. And law itself is only beneficence, the doing of good for society or the distribution of social benefits, acting as a rule. Men have a right to live by that rule. That is to say, there is a right to the rule of law. They have a right to justice. And let's see what that means. Uh, as you'll see, it means uh, those things covered by uh, criminal, civil and common law on the one hand and uh, by administrative law on the other. That is to say, uh, relations between government and citizen should be regulated by a system of justice as should relations between, uh, uh, between peers. So men have a right to live by that rule, they have a right to justice as between their fellows, whether their fellows are in politic function, that's to say public officials, or in ordinary occupation, that's to say uh, you and me. They have a right to the fruit of their, fruit of their industry, that's to say they have a right to property, a very fundamental right in the 18th century, defended by everyone, including the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, though uh, um, violated in practice by uh, revolutionary um, practice. Uh, in addition to the fruit of their industry, they have a right to instruction in life and consolation in death, which basically means uh, um, a right to uh, practice religion, uh, to make the affairs of conscience one's own and to be the um, free bearer of one's own judgment. We recognise all these as uh, human rights today. Uh, but as to the share of power, authority and direction, which each individual ought to have in the arrangement of the state, that I must deny to be amongst the direct original rights of man. What Burke is saying there is that um, we do not have a right to frame a government in any way whatsoever. That's to say, g g the nature of government is not a natural right, but rather something which is established by social convention. Burke's point was here, here was that there are many different valid forms of government. So there is no rights-based template for all governments. Um, rather, there are matters of adaptation and convenience. Um, we do not have a right as such to govern ourselves. We sacrifice that on entering into society, although we're of course represented by a constitution which itself contains many representative organs. Uh, but we do not have a right uh, to govern as um, such. And he believed that the revolutionary doctrine of rights implied as much. Okay, so that's Burke on rights. He's often associated with attacking the rights of man, but you can see he's actually defending those rights whilst redefining them in, uh, um, in the reflections on the revolution in France. Now, as a result of being, Burke being associated with, if you like, um, uh, conservatism as a result of the way he was um, co-opted, as I mentioned, by the Conservative Party in the 1880s, Burke is um, in turn identified as having um, largely defended the institutions of privilege. I've present this, presented this uh, quotation 
this next quotation to you in order to illustrate how things are actually more complicated. I'm taking these quotations, by the way, from J.C.D. Clark's edition of the Reflections on the Revolution in France, published by Stamford University Press. And I'm just telling you that because the page references at the end, if you ever want to go and check them, are there. This is on page 206 of that edition. Now, Burke says, um, far from defending arbitrary privilege, um, I, um, what I stand for is actually talent and virtue in public life. As he says, you do not imagine that I wish to confine power, authority and distinction to blood and names and titles. No, sir. There is no qualification for government, but virtue and wisdom, actual and presumptive. So there is no acceptable basis for the government uh, of human beings uh, by other human beings except these principles, virtue and wisdom, not as, um, as it were, natural entitlement. There is no natural entitlement uh, to govern. Woe to the country which would madly and impiously reject the service of the talents uh, and virtues um, of a given country uh, that are given to given to grace and to service. So government should be based on talent and virtue, as I mentioned. Woe to that country too, that passing into the opposite extreme, and this opposite extreme he's associating with the um, French Revolution, uh, the passing into the opposite extreme considers a low education, a mean contracted view of things, a sordid mercenary occupation as a preferable title to command. So Burke is saying, uh, um, incidentally, a lot of lawyers, um, country attorneys participate, sat in the um, third estate in um, the Estates General in France and ended up therefore in the National Assembly. Burke's view was that there were sub-mediocre lawyers, incompetent with no experience of affairs. So that's what he's getting at and calling them, um, uh, as it were, having contracted views and low education. Uh, they're actually educated. He just thinks they're poor lawyers. Um, presumably by comparison with himself. So everything he says ought to be open, but not indifferently to every man. In other words, the quality of government uh, matters. No rotation, he says, no appointment by lot, no mode of election operating in the spirit of sortition can be generally good in a government conversant in extensive objects. Um, by the way, he's uh, associating uh, French revolutionary practice with the uh, uh, practice of sortition, saying that they are selecting their uh, leaders by just some arbitrary lottery in effect. Uh, sortition, incidentally, was the means of um, election to government in ancient Athens. And incidentally, the Athenians believed um, election itself was an undemocratic uh, principle. So times have changed. Sortition was the name of the game for them. But most commentators in the 18th century thought that Athens was a dire constitutional setup, partly for that reason. So in any case, that's um, just to say, Burke is not a simple or idle defender of privilege. Now this brings me on to the sovereignty um, question with which I'll end uh, on this uh, uh, slide and the next, which. Are, are, are all taken from a particular um, section of the reflections uh, where Burke is um, dealing with the rights of revolution. Now, interestingly, despite, as I've mentioned, his association with the Conservative Party, Burke was a defender of the right to um, take up arms, actually, against one state. So if your rights were violated, you did have recourse um, uh, against um, against uh, that despotism. Uh, now that would actually be a suspension of the uh, of sovereign jurisdiction. Um, Burke believed that that was in extremis a human right, um, but should only be taken, um, only sh should only be undertaken under conditions of dire um, exigency because the rights of sovereignty ordinarily ought to be um, ought to be sacred. Now for Burke, this meant that um, ultimate um, jurisdiction in a polity should not be dismantled, although governmental power should always be called to account. You'll have noticed in the Brexit debate over the last uh, few years, the distinction between a governmental power and a sovereign jurisdiction has been persistently uh, confused. But I'm going to now talk about specifically uh, 
uh, Burke's interest in the right of revolution. And he begins this famous passage in the Reflections by saying um, the line uh, between um, obedience and insurgency is always a fine one. The speculative line of demarca demarcation, as he puts it, where obedience ought to end and resistance must begin, is faint, obscure, and not easily definable. It is not a single act or a single event which determines it. In other words, um, government must be abused and deranged indeed before it can be thought of. This was not applicable as far as he was concerned to, um, to, uh, the, uh, to the French government before the revolution. It was not a, a case of extreme abuse and despotism. Um, so the right of revolution did not apply, albeit he believed it had applied in the American case and it had applied in the case of the Glorious Revolution. So um, Burke goes on then uh, to say, society is indeed a contract. Now in the 18th century and the 17th century, um, the origin of government was often described in terms of a contractual um, arrangement and Burke is appealing to that um, argument here, which was also cited in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in France. And he's saying, yeah, uh, um, the, society we see, we, the societies we live in are indeed founded on contracts. But he goes on to say, not just any old contract. It's the fundamental con contract of the state cannot be violated at whim. It is something that is deserving of respect um, and it is in effect sacred. Uh, and it's sacred for good reasons that we'll uh, come on to uh, at the very end. Um, so society is indeed a contract. Subordinate contracts for objects of mere occasional interest may be dissolved at pleasure, but the state ought not to be considered as nothing better than a partnership agreement in a trade of pepper and coffee, calico or tobacco. So it's not just a trading uh, corporation, a state. Um, uh, it is something altogether uh, more um, elevated. Uh, so not such a thing or some other, as he says, low concern, to be taken up for a temporary interest and to be dissolved by the fancy of the parties. It is to be looked upon with other reverence. Okay, so this is Burke's appeal, if you like to, um, uh, the patriotism which would support any constitution. Now Burke in saying all this, when he's talking about the right of resistance, is not talking about um, uh, uh, protesting on Parliament Square. He's talking about dismantling altogether the institutions of government. Um, there is an ultimate right to that, but only in extremis, and one's hands should tremble before laying them upon the constitution of the, of the state. Um, as he says, because it is not a partnership in things subservient only to the gross animal existence of a temporary and perishable nature. It's not just something connected to our, our animal existence, but it's to do with our spiritual welfare as human beings, which um, links the um, lower with the higher natures and the uh, visible uh, to the invisible world. So uh, the state is something which serves our vocation as human beings, uh, not merely as gross physical creatures, but as um, um, humans with um, um, a spiritual vocation also. So this is my final sheet here and a continuation of the, of, the, of the last quotation where Burke says, the municipal corporations of that universal kingdom are not morally at liberty, at their pleasure, and on their speculations of a contingent improvement, wholly to separate and tear asunder the bands of their subordinate community and to, to dissolve it into an unsocial, uncivil, unconnected chaos of elementary principles. What Burke means there in this high-flown prose is that a municip municipal corporation, a state, does not have a right in the context of this universal kingdom. In other words, the universe presided over by uh, providence, uh, Burke's a Christian, um, uh, states are not at liberty to dismantle their constitutional infrastructures on a whim, uh, just because they feel that maybe um, they might um, arbitrarily come up with something um, with something uh, better. Rather, they should only dismantle uh, their, the foundation stone of their, of their polity, um, albeit they can, in the meantime, hold their governors to account, obviously, by due process. Uh, but to collapse the state is basically 
to declare war against one state, which is what rebellion is, as you remember from uh, the Latin etymology, rebellare, to enter into war once more against your state. That must only be done in the case of um, a dire emergency. Only, um, uh, only that alone, as he puts it in the highlighted part in red that I have before you, uh, which can alone can justify a resort to anarchy. So he concedes that revolution risks anarchy, but that revolution under the right circumstances of outrageous abuse is um, a human entitlement, a human right, uh, but it should only under those um, dire circumstances be entered into uh, because the state is itself um, a sacred enterprise which protects our rights. Otherwise, we have none. Um, and um, our society would be, as he puts it um, at the end, uh, the rebellious, that was to say us, if we did take up arms against our state, um, are outlawed, cast forth and exiled from the world of reason and order and peace and virtue and fruitful penitence into the antagonist world of madness, discord, vice, confusion and unavailing sorrow. So in a nutshell, and my final words are therefore, uh, Burke, of course, was a lawyer. Therefore, prescription mattered to him. Rights mattered even more. Uh, not the right to invade property or to imagine that we simply have a right to govern ourselves. Uh, but when rights are abused, we are entitled to take up arms uh, against our state, to rebel, to revolt. Uh, Burke um, became a conservative icon, but he was a complex Whig, a defender of liberty, and a critic um, of abstract moralism against contextual political judgment. So uh, with that, I'll end and hand over to Lynn to field uh, questions. Thank you, Richard. There's one question at the moment on the chat. So I do encourage people to start getting the questions there or to have them ready. Um, question from Emer. Um, Morrison, um, do you think that there's a similar attitude today to politics? So half a loaf is the same as none, and is this um, cyclical? So do we favour um, a rapid change, then revert back to gradual conservative change, and then back again in a cycle? Well, uh, thanks, Imer. Uh, yes, I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. Um, you'll notice we have gone from um, uh, black lives matter to there is no um, race problem in one fluid movement in the course of some months in Britain. And that's an example, I think, of the seesaw effect that you're um, talking about. In, in longer historical terms, of course, uh, you know, the 60s turned into the 70s, the 70s, the 80s, and so on also, where there is this pendulum effect between um, uh, the assertion of abstract rights and then a clawing back of, um, if you like, conservative um, retrenchment. I do think, however, uh, Burke wanted to stand, although he was a Whig and therefore a party man, I do think he wanted to um, stand um, somewhat above the fray and um, to appeal outside this, as it were, dialectic of, um, of uh, liberty and authority. Um, and, and um, appeal to a more rational basis on which politics could be placed by um, saying that, of course, we have natural rights, but they have to be practicable. And um, in being practicable, we need to draw upon past experience and therefore um, prescriptive right is a good guide to rights generally. But here I'm preaching to the converted because, of course, um, all judicial judgments in this country are precisely based on uh, precedent. So you're aware of this. And this is basically what Burke was appealing to. We don't want to invent our rights every time we enter the courtroom. We want to draw upon a body of uh, practical knowledge. Um. Thank you, Richard. There's a, a, a interesting question um, here from Harry Grimshaw. What would Burke's take be on the UK's handling of the coronavirus pandemic? Yes. Um, since um, publishing on Burke, I, I regularly get asked what would his view uh, be on um, many subjects. Um, 
the honest answer is it's not very easy to answer those questions. He lived in a completely different era. They did things differently then. Um, I think the pandemic is a case of there being no um, available precedents. And so um, government was plunged into uh, confusion, a smoking ruin, as one uh, former aide described the um, described um, the Ministry for Health, for instance. Um, so, I, I do, so from that point of view, insofar as Burke is arguing that experience is the greatest education in political life, I think part of the problem uh, in this case was there was no um, experience. Thank you. We've got a, a, a live question coming in um, from um, it is um, Yatisna Snar. Um, so uh, Yitis, if you could ask the question yourself and then I'll come next, I'll come back to, um, there's, there's a few questions now are just appearing. I'll come back to Daniel's question. Um, but Edis, you want to ask the question yourself. So if you could um, on mute, please. Sure. Um, just as a clarifying point, are you how aware are you of the HR 51 Act in America and the DC sort of statehood uh, sort of position that's going on at this point? With a view to with a view to illuminating it for you. Uh, well, it relates to the question, so I just want to make sure there's sort of the, the foundation. Just give us a, throw the question out, and we'll see how far we get. Okay, so my question is, what would first of your opinion be towards this and what would do you think Burke would be towards this? The idea of DC statehood being sort of the, from the natural side, obviously you want representation within Congress for the United States, sort of uh, the executive, both the executive branch and the parliamentary sort of side, but with the caveat that obviously you could look at prescription by the fact that the Federalist Papers expressly state that there is a specific reason for the DC administration not to become a state because it would then have influence from the its other governors having statehood over the Congress itself. Yes, that's very interesting. Um, well, of course, Burke was dealing with um, a different constitutional um, structure altogether, which was um, Crown, Lords and Commons, uh, which did influence the um, American uh, constitutional design. And Burke did also, uh, although he was a critic of the French revolutionary constitutional construction, which he thought was um, incoherent as to the division between legislative and executive power altogether. In other words, the role of uh, Louis XVI was not clearly differentiated from the role of the National Assembly altogether. He actually applauded the, um, the US constitution um, and uh, spoke about it um, in Parliament um, in 1791. Um, now, uh, as far as he was concerned, um, uh, um, questions of um, uh, representation were multifarious uh, and should be taken in various senses. First of all, um, the state represented you. S second of all, the various portions of the constitution uh, represented you themselves differently. So the House of Lords, as far as he was concerned, does perform a representative function as the Crown does also. And then there are the elected representatives in the House of Commons, and they've got a specific representative function um, function again. Obviously, he'd no view of um, constitutional developments in 21st century the United States, but um, you have some sense of how he thought about uh, the problems therefore uh, generally. That's to say, um, constitutional reform should be governed by precedent altogether. And what he was objecting to was the idea of, of um, uh, reinventing the wheel every time you went, every time you sought to express a political opinion. So uh, precedent, precedent was not valuable simply because it um, was the past. This is that what people um, are people are mistaken in thinking that Burke is simply defending the past because it's the past. The point is, it's tried practice, and therefore we know how it has worked, and that's how why prescription um, must be a guide. Why, in other words, it does naturally confer right. Um, it, you know, human nature uh, credits prescription. That's to say, um, I, you know, I've owned this pen for three years. I found it originally, but now I feel it's mine. That's a prescriptive right. Um, 
but um, it also, in addition to having a sort of psychological basis, is just intelligent because um, precedent gives you an example of earlier functionality and therefore is um, an intelligent guide in public life. Thank you, um, Richard. We've got five questions in just to give you an idea of the time. So we've got about, oh, just about 12 minutes um, left for five questions. So if anybody's got any burning questions, you need to get them in in the next two minutes, please. Um, so Richard, next question. Um, uh, uh, let me just see. Simranjit Singh Digpal. Um, how would Burke have dealt with the prorogation of Parliament as seen in the UK in 2019? Yes. Uh, by the way, Lynn, if you want me to take a few at once at, at any stage, that, that, that's also fine by me. Um, yeah, again, um, given that that was in due course subject to um, judicial decision um, and it's impossible to know what Burke would have thought, I think in this case, um, one could make a very good guess that he would have thought of it as um, a clear violation of uh, precedent and therefore, um, in effect, a constitutional aberration. Um, and, uh, um, and there he would have, of course, uh, have coincided with um, the Supreme Court itself. So that's a clear case of deviation and an, an invasion of established right. Obviously, uh, there are other opinions. Uh, next one is uh, Daniel uh, Calderamas. Um, a theme of Burke's thought as presented is the contrast between justice and the rule of law and progressive revolution and radical change. Is Twitter-led a uh, discourse, uh, which he says is a modern form of activism, a challenge to the rule of law in the Burkean sense, or is it more complex than that? Yeah. Um... The, the technology post-dates Burke, but it, it is a very interesting question um, because it's about um, the publication of opinion and the challenges that may have for um, public discourse generally. Um, interestingly, Burke in his own time was responsible for opening up the channels of political discourse uh, further than had been habitually the case. Um, so I think for Burke, it would depend on the opinions expressed. Um, it's impossible for anyone to have anticipated um, Twitter in the specific sense that while there's a, a very lively press in the 18th century um, and a large, um, you know, um, culture of pamphlet publication um, and also various uh, protest movements, um, the unregulated expression of opinion on that scale, um, I think it would have been a cause for alarm, certainly. Um, and although these opinions are regulated after the fact, even the very existence of communities of um, um, self-enforcing opinion in little microclimates, um, I think... Um, well, I think is disturbing, and therefore I'm going to take the liberty of presuming that um, Burke would agree with me, uh, and he would have said, yes, it's disturbing. Um, I mean, so much uh, US and UK news, uh, I mean, this is a, a defense of the BBC, really, in the end. Um, it's usually dismantle a national broadcasting um, institution and people uh, join the ranks of their already established party opinions and then get to further confine themselves in a Twitter sphere where they get their own um, potentially deranged views echoed back at themselves and um, seemingly confirmed endlessly uh, that has to be uh, a worry for any liberal democracy. In other words, we must be exposed to, to other views and also vetted views. You know, there must be a system of responsibility, I think. Okay, I'm sure Burke would agree with you, Richard. Um, I think so. <laughs> definitely. Um, we've got seven questions. So if I give you three in a, in a batch, would that yeah. be okay? Yeah. Okay, um, Jessica uh, baxter Clucas first. What do you think Burke would dislike most about modern society and government? And then the second question is from uh, James Carr. 
Um, was Burke deeply informed by his religious faith? Um, or was, it, was he of a deist like Jefferson, suffused by enlightenment values? And then Robert Lewis, um, is reflections on the revolution the best starting point for any reader wishing to approach Burke? And is there a Burke text that you uh, consider um, to have been overlooked or personally value that you would like to draw our attention to? Very good. Should I take them in reverse order? Because why not? Yep. Yep. Um, so um, I do think that uh, the reflections is Burke's uh, greatest work and I, I rec recommend it to um, all those um, attending this, um, this, this talk. Um, I, I did when I was, when I was younger, uh, I did discover some um, uh, Burke texts in, in um, manuscript. I, I'd like to recommend those, um, but um, you know, I don't think they're the greatest of Burke's works, but it was nice to discover something which no one had ever seen before. Um, I think if I was to uh, recommend, recommend another um, text, therefore, in addition to the re reflections, I would recommend um, his speech on um, Fox's India Bill, um, because it was a uh, um, a great passionate concern uh, of Burke's, the treatment of India um, under the East India Company. Um, Burke was um, an Anglican um, and a committed Anglican, uh, though a, a liberal skeptical Anglican in a, in a way, that's to say he believed in the toleration of all faiths um, uh, and had lots of sympathy for Catholicism, was brought up, um, however, uh, as a, as a, as a as a Protestant, and he was opposed to and critical of deism. Specifically, he was um, critical of their view of providence. Uh, when we get into technicalities there, that would detain us, but, but basically he wasn't in favour of the idea that there was a creator who then sat back paring its fingernails. He believed that a prov providence um, should be understood as being concerned about uh, human welfare. So to that extent, um, he was, was not a deist. Um, finally, um, in relation to what he disliked most, what he would have disliked most about um, society today, I think he would have been very critical of uh, moral campaigning which disregarded facts. Um, and I think that becomes increasingly, that is increasingly common in my um, social sphere, that's to say in the university classes. Um, that's to say, um, outraged opinion um, without um, it being modified by the reality of other opinions on the one hand and by the complexity of the world on the other. So um, I think he was um, uh, a critic in the end, ultimately, of fundamentalisms of all stripes. Okay, there's, uh, I'm going to give you another three questions and uh, then I think there's another three left. Um, Everyone, uh, questions, I think I'll have to close them now because we're running out of time. So uh, the next three questions, uh, Tony Kay is the first one. Um, when Burke wrote Reflections, the revolution had hardly gotten off the ground. How did he view the later um, vicissitudes through uh, 1797? Would he have been a fan of Napoleon, codification of laws um, alongside the smack of firm uh, government? Uh, next one is Adetunji um, Amole. Um, Burke uh, supported the American Revolution and uh, was fairly damning of the British government, whereas he was critical of the French Revolution. Do these contrasting stances of Burke's have anything to do at all with his coming from a common law training and tradition? And then uh, Anna um, Mosakowska, um, how would Burke see today, uh, today's issue of abortion and right to prolong um, the life and the right uh, to decide about a woman's body? Um, would he say that Northern Ireland is right or is England right? Okay, great. Why don't we take them in actual order then rather than reverse order this time? Um, so, um, yes, Burke's uh, um, reflections are, as I mentioned, November 1790. I mean, stuff had happened. Um, he was early as a critic. It's important maybe to recognise that many 
um, defenders of the revolution early on themselves became uh, sympathetic to Burke later on and critics them themselves. So he did chart the course of the revolution and wrote, uh, wrote many other works on it down to 1796. And of course, his correspondence is available also. So he's still banging on on that theme um, on his deathbed in 1797. Um, he didn't survive into the Napoleonic era, um, but I don't think he would have been an admirer of Napoleon. No, because he was interested in um, responsible government. And even if Napoleon generated a code of laws, which many revolutionaries in Germany, for instance, applauded, um, from Burke's point of view, the promulgation of law by an unaccountable um, ruler is um, some comfort, but sorry comfort, because you're still under the authority of a single ruler. Um, well, um, the American case coming to the second question is a complicated one, because I, I, I slightly simplified the position when I spoke about this earlier. Uh, Burke defended uh, the American right to assert their rights, um, but he didn't actually support their secession from the empire, just to make that clear. So he supported actually their rebellion uh, for complex um, reasons to, uh, to do with the situation in 1775 uh, and the um, uh, embargo on trade, which he thought was a threat to um, uh, the colonists' fundamental rights, no trade, no food. Um, therefore, they did have a right to rebel, but he wanted to coax them back into the empire as, uh, as, a, as a common project. Was this informed by his views of the common law? Well, not as defense of their rebellion, uh, but his uh, sympathy for the Americans by comparison with the French, yes, because he believed that um, um, uh, France was doing the, performing the equivalent act of d d denying the significance of the equivalent of any common law uh, provisions. Um, Abortion. Um, I think that's impossible to um, answer because there's just no concept of it at the time. He clearly supported the right to life in the generic sense uh, of the right to life and liberty. Um, but then there's the question of uh, when is a life a life? And this is pre-biological science um, and um, and uh, examination of the status of, you know, the, the, the as it were, personality status uh, or legal status of a fetus. So um, I have to draw a blank there, but I'm sure he would have too. Thank you. There's, there's just uh, two, qu two uh, questions remaining. Yeah. So Andrew Brooke is the first one. Um, to what extent were there explicit common law influences in Burke's philosophy of prescriptive rights? And then Nasser uh, Anani, I hope I've, I've pronounced that and got that in, in the right order. Apologies if not. Um, how would Burke have perceived um, the 19th uh, century colonization of Africa? Okay, um, well, I think I could be quite qu fairly quick with Andrew's important question, um, which is that uh, the, the, the major influences were Edward Cook and Sir Matthew Hale. There's no doubt about that. So as, ex as exemplars of, uh, first of all, common law procedures, and of course also as parliamentarians, um, because the defense of common law in the 17th century had been very much um, a defense of parliament against crown. And Burke as a Whig derives exactly from this um, tradition. So Cook and Hale are uh, the main influences, but again, there were other more proximate um, 18th century influences um, too. In relation to um, the development of colonization in the, um, in the 19th century, um, I think, um, but it's important to make some distinctions which we no longer make. Um, as from Burke's perspective, for instance, 18th century India was not a colonial arrangement, but an imperial arrangement. America was a colonial arrangement. Colonization in the original acceptation of the term, and as it was used in the 18th century, meant um, plantation. It meant the settlement of populations in new territories to cultivate those uh, territories. And of course, a colonial derives from the Latin term colere, to cultivate, because all these settlers were farmers. So um, Ireland was um, settled under Cromwell and of course in the Jacobean uh, period also. Um, South Africa would be colonial, America would be colonial, 
Um, but technically, um, Africa and India, not apart from South Africa. So if you mean Western East Africa, not because um, um, colonialism meant um, the settlement of um, white population. So Canada was a colony, um, Australia was a colony, and New Zealand was a colony. The nomenclature changed in the 20th century due to what office was responsible for the colonies. Um, of course, um, the India office was, was responsible for India originally, so again in that sense it was not colonial. But everything got associated, all dependencies and possessions in the course of the 20th century got grouped together under the title um, um, colonial. So we tend to run them together now, although it's interesting and useful to distinguish them. The case of Africa in particular takes off in the 1870s um, and there was much debate at the time as to what was driving this new wave of um, conquest and, and control, um, but it was definitely a distinct um, pattern from what Burke had been um, accustomed to. But I'd be confident to say that it's close, the closest analogy would be with the East India Company, that's to say um, uh, the establishment of uh, trading bases for the exploitation of uh, natural resources in due course being converted into the control of population. Now Burke was highly critical of that in the Indian case and I think it's reasonable co to conclude that in the case of um, Africa he'd have been highly critical also. Um, Richard, uh, thank you so much. Um, those were, um, I'm sure you'll agree, Richard, uh, fantastic questions. And actually it's a testament to um, how engaging you were as a speaker that you um, got um, all the students thinking about contemporary applications of, um, of Burke's thinking. Um, Richard, it, it just remains for me to thank you so much um, for that absolutely fascinating talk tonight. We're, we're indeed, as I said at the start of the meeting, extremely uh, and truly honoured um, to have you address us this evening. And um, as I mentioned before, again, it's also, um, it's a qualifying session for the students. So um, hugely important, counts towards their um, eventual um, call to the bar, um, which um, I, I just want to thank you in particular for um, not just um, explaining um, about Burke's influence in, in the context of his time, but also that you were willing um, to look at the contemporary influences as well. Um, which is um, what made this such an important uh, QS for the students. Um, I'd also just like to thank everyone for attending today. It was really great to see so many students. We had, uh, I made it 107 uh, people in the room. So I think that's the highest number, um, Richard, you've drawn the highest number I think we've ever had at a, a Middle Temple. Um, historical society meeting. So I think um, if that isn't um, a call to have more online events in the future, nothing is. So um, a couple of people have also asked about availability of slides and so on. The event is being recorded and it's going to be available on the usual Middle Temple sites um, for anyone that needs access. Um, Richard, were we able to have the honour of seeing you in person? I would at this point um, gift you as our gift from Middle Temple, um, a copy of um, our book, A History of the Middle Temple, um, which is uh, edited by um, Master Richard Havery, who has been a member, uh, I think, of our society since um, since the, the late 80s when it was actually founded. So um, if I can do that virtually, um, Richard, to give you a copy of our book and um, we will arrange for it to be sent at, at some point in the post. Um, so I hope it's not going to be too delayed. I just have to source one if uh, if I can't actually physically get one from the, the Treasury office. But that, that is our small token um, of appreciation um, for giving up your time. And also the fact that we can't offer you one of our lovely Middle Temple meals accompanied with uh, Middle Temple wine, which we which we normally would do. Um, but as the inn is currently closed, um, unfortunately, we can't do that. But just um, on behalf of everyone, um, thank you so much. 
absolutely fascinating and your engagement with the questions and so on and and the students as as would would be expected um just brought it uh, brought it into a whole new uh, modern light for our our students today and and actually what um the influence of burke uh, still is on 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 modern politics and and world events today so um i'd just like to thank uh, oliver munsey uh, from middle temple um, who made this all possible uh, tonight with the technology. Um, any of our masters of the bench, um, I know there are a few of you here. Um, thank you so much for attending and supporting the event. Um, to our, uh, our newly elected committee um, of Middle Temple, thank you all for attending. To any of our members who are here, guests and students, Middle Temple or otherwise, um, thank you all so much for attending. Um, I, I think, I, I don't know if I bring the meeting to an end or, or all of the Lynn, may, may I just offer my own thanks also you, just before we close? Absolutely. Oh, we're not just... closing just yet. Um, okay. So I, sure. I'll just hand over, but um, I, I'm not sure um, if if, uh, if anybody just wants to have a word with you, maybe if they could just hang around. I don't think we get cut off immediately. That's what I was about to say, but thank you again, Richard. So um, over to you. Yes, well, I'd also like to thank uh, the organisers um, so much. I should say I will be at Middle Temple again myself because my wife Beatrice Collier is a member. Um, I'd like to thank the audience um, very much for attending and also all those excellent uh, questions. Also, my daughters, uh, Sophia and Claudia Burke, are watching. So I'd like to, as they say in the modern parlance, give a shout out to them. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Beatrice and uh, Richard Storage, you're, both, you're, you're all very welcome. I, di I didn't realise that you were here, otherwise I would have welcomed you earlier. But I'm not sure if we're going to be cut off immediately, but um, if anybody wants to say anything at this point, or, or thank Richard, um, I don't seem to have a, a, a cut off button here, but um, if, Richard, if you've got five minutes, if, if anybody wants to come in, if you just uh, um, on, on mute, um, we can probably stay for another five minutes or so, if that's okay, Richard, with you. Yeah, anyone, um, if you just want to come in. I think, is it someone trying to unmute themselves? Does anybody want to say anything? Um, uh, Adetunji, did, did you have a question? Or you just came up on Muta there. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard, for the excellent presentation. Uh, stretched uh, stretch our knowledge uh, quite a bit. I'm a student at the uh, Middle Temple. So in, with regards to the American Revolution and the Federalist Papers, that sparked a lot of interest, Thomas Jefferson, uh, John Adams, Hamilton, and so on. They reflected so much the common law tradition. Whereas if we were to go to on the French side, and I agree with Buck that they were all over the place, not that they were not educated, but there was nothing of the sort that inspired the revolution. That was academic, well thought out, based on a genuine tradition. Would you say this was a major reason why Burke basically found out the French, so to speak, and didn't do the same with the Americans? Um, yes, that's interesting. I think what I think is um, that uh, I mean a, a, a lot of it. A lot of it came down to the. Um, constitutional arrangement which was being proposed in France by comparison with um, in the United States um, and what Burke believed that any constitutional arrangement had to relate to the society um, in which it was formed and in the French case social arrangements were completely disregarded um, whereas in the, in the American case it was it was a constitution in order to um, fit the world as it existed so that was his major um, objection and also by comparison he thought the Americans had some experience of affairs whereas in the French case he thought they were green largely because of course they were entering into politics on on the back of um, the um, ex existence of a non-participatory regime so um, old regime, old regime France, the ancien regime, 
was um, an absolute monarchy uh, and therefore um, publicists um, and um, um, philosophers were not exposed to um, power in the same way as they had been in Britain. I mean, Locke had political experience and Hobbes had political experience. They were both um, advisors to leading Whigs in the 17th century. There's no equivalent in France. Its intellectual culture was collected in salons, but they were not part of um, uh, political life, strictly speaking. So the invasion of the state by philosophy was, as far as he was concerned, the invasion of uh, public life by um, untutored naivety. So that's fundamentally his criticism. But of course, that criticism is taken up by Tocqueville too. So, I mean, Burke's not alone. And many other, Fre the French thought it also subsequently. Um, thank you for that question, Adetunji. And uh, uh, Richard, um, we've, we've only got the room for an, uh, another couple of minutes. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll close it down here rather than ending up with you being cut out mid-flow. But um, thank you so much again. Um, and um, uh, just have a, just thank you for taking so much time. We've, we've run on a bit further than we, we should have done, um, but it was very nice of you to bring your family um, as well. So just to wish you a, a very good evening and you will be welcome um, to come to any of our meetings with Beatrice in, in the future. And hopefully we can give you some um, hospitality and some, some wine at some point in the future. Um, but just want to wish you um, a good evening, what's left of it. And uh, then to all our, our guests and everyone who attended, um, if I could just say goodbye on behalf of the society and it would be uh, lovely to see you at some of our future events. The next talk's coming up on the 20th of April, the information's on the Middle Temple. So um, Richard, thank you again and good night. And uh, good night to everyone from Ireland. <laughs> okay.